Okay, welcome everybody to the North American Fruit Explorers 2021 virtual conference, Fruit Forward, Growing for Tomorrow. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Chris Omanix and I'm a volunteer board member of NAFEX, as we call the organization for short, as you know. And I'll be serving as a facilitator for this session entitled Exploring Wild and Cultivated Orchards. Before I introduce today's panel, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items and a little bit about NAFEX as we allow a few more people to join in. And it looks like we're at about 34. First, this is a webinar. And so unlike regular Zoom meetings, participants' audio and video features are automatically disabled. Second, we encourage you to ask questions. Please use the Q&A tab in Zoom to ask topical or technical support questions for our co-host. Third, if you're newer to Zoom, you can adjust your screen view and some of the Zoom settings on your device. And finally, this webinar is being recorded, which means they'll be made available to members like you and, and uh, con conference participants at nafex.org. So tell your friends. So a little bit about NAFEX. We were founded in 1967 as a network of individuals throughout the United States and Canada devoted to the discovery, cultivation, and appreciation of superior varieties of fruit and nuts. Although the, although the ranks of our membership include professional pomologists, nursery owners, and commercial orchardists, NAFEX members are all amateurs in the truest sense of the word, and we are all motivated by our love of fine fruit. NAFEX members share ideas, information, experiences, and fruit propagating material via our website, social media channels, specific fruit interest group meetings, and annual conferences like this one, whether in person or online or both. As a paid NAFEX member, you get four editions of the Pomona Journal each year, as well as the ability to search back through 50 years of Pomona's in our digital library, thanks to Taylor, which contain, and they, they really do, they contain a wealth of information. Uh, I recommend you go check it out if you haven't already. This organization exists because of fruit members, fruit growing members like you, and we encourage you to continue your membership and become actively involved as an interest group member, a committee member, or a board member. Please visit our website at nafex.org to learn more. So it's, my, it's, it's sincerely my pleasure to introduce our panel members and featured speakers tonight. So we are joined by Dan Bussey, you know him and love him, the author of the seven volume set, the illustrated History of Apples in the United States and Canada. Sean Williams, who is an heirloom fruit preservationist and plantsman in Illinois. And Matt Kaminsky of Gnarly Pippins, who is both an orchardist and a shepherd from Hadley, Massachusetts. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, I'm going to introduce Dan Bussey first. He'll be speaking first. Dan is an apple historian, cider maker, and former orchard manager for the Seed Saver Exchange in Decorah, Iowa. He is now the orchardist for Silver, Silverwood Park Heirloom Apple an Heirloom Apple Orchard near Edgerton, Wisconsin. He is the author, author of the seven volume Illustrated History of Apples in the United States and Canada. And you can get a copy of that epic book at jackcawpress.com. So go ahead, Dan, and take it away. Right. Okay. Well, thank you all for being here. This is a real treat to be able to speak to you all tonight. I think I last spoke to um, the NAFEX meeting when it was held in person in Iowa a few years ago. And I've been a NAFEX member back since I think the 80s when uh, there was an actual lending library where they would send you books through the mail because there weren't, you know, things weren't digitized and online. So it was really something uh, at that time. And so uh, I've been a member for the most most of all those years since then. 
anyways, uh, I appreciate the introduction, uh, Chris. And uh, yeah, it uh, the, the book is something I'm, I'm pretty proud of and I'm really tickled that uh, you mentioned it. Um, it was obviously a very long, lengthy process to put that together because I did most of it uh, without the benefit of internet libraries. So I spent about 30 years um, traipsing up to the UW library, uh, the Steenbach Library in Madison, Wisconsin, where I would gather a grocery sack full of books, horticultural library reports and uh, state pomology reports and take those home and scan them over the weekend, uh, just page by page and, and uh, gleaning bits of information. But um, that was after I started being interested in apples. That came a long time before that. So um, anyways, where I got started was as I grew up in the middle of my old family farm orchard back in Wisconsin that was planted in the 1800s. And uh, when I was a kid, the, a lot of the trees were still there. They were huge old trees. Uh, they were in pretty bad shape. And of course, at, at being a kid, I wasn't particularly interested in those things. Um, you know, if I had apples to chuck at my brother when he was being a rat, and uh, that was that was kind of fun. But years later, um, the few trees were still there, and one one fall day, my father suggests that we go pick all the apples that we could uh, from the trees and on the ground and collect them together. And we were going to run down to a local cider mill to make cider, and so we gathered everything we could, threw it in the family station wagon, and went down there. It was about ten miles away, and all those apples got crushed into a wonderful sweet cider, which was a pretty, pretty interesting experience to see this old thing run. This was a press that had been in this orchard since 1913. It was an old Mount Gilead uh, Model 8C, which uh, handles about 15 bushels of apples at a time. Um, and it was a wonderful old thing with a hydraulic press and a big belt motor that ran this, this press, an old time thing. And uh, Little did I know that many years later, I would purchase that same press and restore it and uh, make cider myself from. So I've been doing that for a long time. So when I first got married back in 1979, oh Lord, that was a long time ago, I ran across a book, uh, book review in the old Country Journal magazine um, called Apples and Man. By, it was by, written by Fred Lape. Here's a copy of it. This is the copy that I bought back in 79. It's a wonderful book. It's quite quaint in comparison to a lot of the books I've read, but it was one of those things that sort of opened my eyes to the world of heirloom apples and how wonderful some of them are, uh, or were, I should say, in many cases, they're gone. But uh, it was fascinating to me, and I got really wrapped up in the names of the apples. I thought they were pretty fascinating. And, uh, you know, you get uh, cow snout, cheap nose, cat's head, uh, red astrogen, uh, Black Amish, all those different ones. And I just thought that was really fascinating. And in the back of this book was a brief listing of the few nurseries that were selling heirloom apples at the time, because there weren't many, there were very few. And so we uh, went, uh, I went and ordered a catalog from the one particular nursery it mentioned, and that was Baum's Nursery in New Fairfield, Connecticut. A nice German gentleman by the name of Otto Baum who ran it. And he was a fascinating guy. And this is a copy of the catalog I received in 1981. I think I had one the year before, but I can't find that. But this is, this is the catalog. I'll show you all there is. It's just basically brief listings of the few varieties, um, very short description, not much history about them or anything like that. But I thought that was really fascinating. And so I sent for a few of the apples. And it got me really thinking about, well, I'd love to find out, you know, where these apples came from. Um, what's the history of them? Um, where did they come from? And what do they taste like? The descriptions here were so brief, it gave you a taste of what, what you might expect. And as these apples fruited for me, I realized how absolutely fabulous some of them were. I started out with ones like Golden Sweet and others uh, that were just uh, an amazing, amazing apple. That's an apple from Connecticut, of course. Beautiful. It has the quirky habit of growing sort of crookedly, the, the limbs on it. And I think it's one of those that I think is um, part of a Malus Silversii, uh, or Sylvester, excuse me, um, that has a little bit of fall color. So it has a little bit of European wild crab in it. Uh, but it's a large, sweet apple. It's really nice. So... I decided I was going to start looking into what 
it uh, took to find more information about these varieties. And I knew nothing about that sort of thing. I'd gone to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I was going to be a journalism major, but I ended up uh, uh, dropping out to uh, work in my family's business. And so I remembered being in the study hall in that library and knew they had quite a selection of fruit books. So I started going there in the early 80s and gleaning whatever I could. It was hard to find a lot of material. And I had to teach myself the bibliography of Apple books. Now it's a lot easier to, to navigate through all this because you have such internet libraries that are available um, and things I never thought I'd ever see. And so uh, I learned what was out there and I learned to find these books as best as I could. The library was had a great selection, but they didn't have everything I would like to find. So I started cultivating uh, friendships with uh, antiquarian booksellers and uh, finding books wherever I could, acquiring things whenever I could afford it. Uh, I had a young family at the time, and of course, money's tight, but I always made it a priority of whenever I could squirrel away a good book, I would. And so it taught me then that there are so many apples out there that I had no idea existed. You know, most people's world of apples consist of about 20 or 30 varieties maximum, the few things that you find in the store. And so when I realized there were more things out there than that, it really got me to looking. And so I got really involved with collecting as many varieties of apples as well as collecting the books that told me about them. So I started keeping a, a, a journal about what apple um, varieties that I could find, any kind of information, um, that sort of thing. And Little by little, uh, it was getting to be kind of onerous. So I bought a state-of-the-art 286 computer with a 40 megabyte hard drive, which is pretty pretty sad. My watch probably has more power in it than my computer did. But anyways, um, I started keeping a journal of everything I could find and going through all these books. It was fascinating. And the names, of course, is what kind of hooked me in there. And of course, it, I learned the history of it. So I'm dealing mostly, of course, with cultivated apples, which is part of our talk tonight, is navigating the interest in cultivated and wild wild apples. But when I come to find that when you read, of course, it's nice to find information about the varieties, but it's also really fascinating to find those little tidbits that are in the books that tell you things about it, uh, growing tips, where it does well or where it doesn't well do well, and little quirky things about the people involved. And so over time, it got to be kind of fun to put more and more of this together. And the ultimate book that I ever thought I would ever run across was the Nomenclature to the Apple that was put out in 1905 through the USDA by William Henry Ray. It was a wonderful piece of work. But unfortunately, when I finally was able to get a copy, it was much like this catalog from Otto Baum. Very, very scant bit of information. It was mostly an exercise in altering the names of the apple, hence the term nomenclature, about um, trying to simplify the naming structure of apples. I know this is sort of semantics with a lot of people and I've gotten really kind of involved with that. It's kind of important to me is understanding the way apples are named, um, how that process is, and there was an effort starting back in the 1840s, uh, I think with the uh, one of the Massachusetts, Horti not the Mass Horticulture Society, but um, another one that was also in the state, I've gone brain dead here for a second, uh, the second oldest uh, horticultural society in the United States. Well, there were apples being exhibited at their fruit shows that were things like hog pen or ladies thighs and really wonderful things like that, very, very descriptive elements. And uh, not Tower Hill, Matt, not, not Tower Hill. But anyways, um, so they really wanted to have people come and exhibit apples that had sensible names, ones that were sort of upstanding with citizenry involved with putting on these shows. They didn't want these sort of scandalous names to be attached to them. And so there was an effort that was going on for quite a while. We would, I think it was mentioned that we would rather have apples named anonymously than have ones with, attached with these, these, these horrible names to it. And so that drifted on for quite a while. And eventually the American Pomological Society picked it up. And they, um, under the guys, I think it was T.T. Line who originally first took on the project 
And then after he passed away, it was assigned to William Henry Reagan, a long established family from Indiana of homologists. And so he was the right guy for the job. And so they went through and sort of changed the names to sometimes from like Westfield, seek no further. They hated that. They would just call it Westfield and other things. But in the process, you lose so much of the history. You lose so much of the sort of nuances and sense of the apple. Um, and it has been sort of a point of mine to go back and give them the name that they were originally christened with. I think that's very important. And also in the process, I find out that a lot of these apples have had their names misspelled. There's a lot of phonetic translations. If I was to tell you a name of an apple, you wrote down what you thought I heard, you would find that sometimes it's somewhat different. So there are in the record, there are mistakes that are made. And it's sort of, I feel my job at this point in time to correct those mistakes, going back and sort of searching through the history of these varieties and finding the true original name, uh, the person involved with it, the stories that they have to tell um, and go back with that. So I'm working on an expanded version of the seven volume set, uh, which will probably be available online, but it will be a while till that happens. It's, it's a lot of fun researching. So my work in apples started uh, on my own home orchard in, in Wisconsin. I started with a lot of things that I acquired locally um, from various nurseries like Otto Baum. And, uh, and I had about 250 varieties, I think at one time in my own orchard. And I ran this old cider press that I had bought and was having a great time with it. And then years later, I was involved with the Seed Savers Exchange and doing grafting workshops with them. I've taught grafting classes for now probably 34 or five years. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing to do because the way to collect some of these varieties, you have to learn how to graft your fruit trees. And um, the first year I grafted, I think I did 10 trees and I got eight to take. And I figured, well, any fool can make this happen. So the more I learned about it, the worse um, it actually is. So. Um, have fun with it. That's the main thing. Don't get too too wrapped up about it. But anyways, drifting. So I got seriously involved with commercial varieties and cultivated varieties. And they are absolutely some fascinating things that I've learned um, to sample and try. And my, my taste horizons have expanded exponentially because of the way I've been able to access um, the apple trees that I had in my own orchard. And then when, of course, I came to the Seed Savers Exchange, uh, when I got there at the time, when I got there in 2012, there were about 550 varieties of apples. Um, they had originally had planted about 750 varieties. And over the years, some varieties had been lost and issued. So when I got there, my job was to sort of scout and find the replacements for as many of those varieties as we had lost, and then to find um, other historic varieties that were sort of especially uh, important to the upper Midwest. Uh, so our collection was going to be, of course, different than most of the um, apple collections that were in different parts of the country. And so since that time, uh, the world of seedlings has sort of come about, and that's uh, been seriously a lot of fun. Um, I was out collecting not too long ago and I found some little gems like this beautiful apple here. Uh, it looks more, almost like a pear in some respects, but upside down. And uh, anyways, it's a wonderful tree and it tastes like a pear. That's the fun thing about it. So I've run across some really good people who have taken me to places where there are just hillsides of wild apple trees. They're all over in Minnesota. They're all over in some of the Driftless area in Wisconsin, in Iowa, that um, there'll be um, hundreds, if not almost thousands of trees in some of these valleys that have not been bothered for a long time. And we found a couple of really dandies. Uh, my friend Gary Smith from uh, Decorah, Iowa, um, he introduced a variety. Uh, he and I both uh, introduced a variety to the Wisconsin Horti or, uh, Apple Growers Association a few years ago. And they were growing it in their uh, uh, experiment station in uh, in the Upper Peninsula or um, in Door County, excuse me. Um, it's a variety called Cronebush Cider. I think Cummins Nursery had it for a brief amount of time. Um, it's one that is probably one of the more interesting apples. It's 
We had it tested by Charles McGonigal of Apple True Winery in Burlington, Wisconsin. And he's a longtime cider maker and he found it was in about the upper 90th percentile as far as phenolic compounds. Um, and it's extremely sweet. It's around 20, the year we first picked it, it was about 25 degrees bricks, which was a pretty significant amount of sugar, but you can't taste that when you bite the apple and it's so astringent, it's amazing. So that's one that we've introduced. Uh, we have several nurseries, or excuse me, orchards in Wisconsin, some cideries that are growing it, probably over a thousand trees of it now that's out here. And so the world of, of cultivated apples is, is astounding, but these uh, new seedling apples that are coming along that people like Sean and Matt are finding that you guys will hear from later on, uh, they're doing some fabulous work and I think it's really something. Here's another um, seedling apple that was sent to me from a friend of mine in Marcus, Iowa. And it was just a wild tree and it's one of the most gorgeous apples and it just fits in the hand so well. Um, it may be a seedling of a golden delicious, but if you um, actually ever have had a good golden delicious off the tree, it is nothing like the ones you find in the store. Uh, it's actually a pretty decent apple. And I suggest that you um, um, don't, you, to get past that point, find a good um, tree um, that you can pick the apples from and you'll find that it's such a better apple. Anyway, so out and about, there are just just lots of things to be found. And so I'm working on a new project now in the Silverwood Orchard in uh, Southern Wisconsin. It's just a short ways from where I grew up. And so we're having it as a Wisconsin heritage uh, orchard, as well as a lot of the things that I was working with at the Seed Savers Exchange and bringing them there to have it as a community orchard, which means that anyone can come into the orchard and sample anything that's there we're gonna set it up so we have QR codes on the trees so you can walk up if you have a cell phone. And by looking at it, you'll be able to say, find out all the information about this apple, um, about the tree, how it grows, um, season, everything about it. Even if there isn't fruit on it, you'll be able to find out all there is about this apple. And we'll be able to start teaching classes. So uh, on apple, of course, and tree care and cider making and uh, apple pie baking, and, uh, my mother was a home ec teacher and she taught her sons to, to bake considering a dubious employment or marital prospects, at least we wouldn't starve. Um, so I've learned to make a pretty mean apple pie, but having availability to all these really interesting apples, be it cultivated or wild seedlings, just makes for a fabulous um, culinary treats. So it's uh, been a real joy. Um, let's see, I don't know where else we can go with this at this point in time, but um, where, um, what I'm working in now is another book on Wisconsin apples. I found out that Wisconsin was home to probably 300 and some different varieties of apples. And I've got a list here of those. If anybody's interested, I would be more than happy to send that to you. Um, and I've been able to find some, some interesting manuscripts. This is one from a private library. I'll show that to you. This was done by, John S. Harris, who was a member of the Minnesota Horticultural Society, and he put together a manuscript about all the varieties that he used to deal with in uh, La Crescent, Minnesota, which is along the Mississippi, uh, not that far from La Crosse, just across the river, actually. And so we are trying to locate all these varieties that are still potentially extant in different collections or orchards or backyards or wherever we can find them. So that's a project that we are endeavoring to do um, now. And the thing is, everyone in every state has probably now access to the information you can take to look for existing apples in your own state or your own region um, and find things to bring out. I've been fortunate to have reintroduced the Plum Cider, the Brilliant, the Windsor, also known as Windsor Chief, the Yankee, the Antonovka Summer, and Winter Sweet Russet. And my latest find, um, it was an apple I was able to uh, identify as the Dockham Russet, which came potentially from New Hampshire um, and came to Sauk County, Wisconsin back in the 1850s. Um, Two more minutes, Dan. Sorry. Oh, good. Okay, a couple more Sorry, minutes. Buddy. All right. Um, so there's a lot of fun things happening. Um, 
The next speakers that are coming on are really, really neat guys. I've known them for a while. Chris, or excuse me, Matt, I've known for a couple of years. And Sean, I've got to communicate over the internet. And he's finding some wonderful things. And I think they got some great stories to tell you. So um, looking forward to hearing you guys. So take it away. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, and I just want to plug that uh, those documents will be available on the uh, Google Drive for people to access and uh, and read all about uh, Dan's findings. So uh, we're going to hold uh, questions and comments till the end, just to keep with the flow. And so now I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Sean Williams. Um, Sean is a self-proclaimed heirloom preservationist and has been growing and collecting open pollinated plants for over 15 years. Preserving and finding lost heritage fruit trees naturally fits in with this motif. And having potentially rediscovered the extinct, extinct, or once thought to be extinct, Dearborn seedling pear, his research efforts have focused on the history of heirloom fruit trees of central Illinois. Traveling through the countryside in a continued pursuit of lost heritage varieties, he has discovered countless wild, wild seedling fruit trees of many different species. Wild trees offer themselves to be almost intermediate or immediate assessment. It, it, sorry, wild trees offer themselves to almost immediate assessment and represent a wealth of untapped genetics. Nowadays, Sean's pursuits of wild trees has moved into cities such as Chicago. And he's told me some funny stories about that. I hope he shares. Understanding the sociology of how fruit is consumed, disposed of, and grows in the urban jungle has become invaluable to him when searching cities. His hope is to find more lost varieties and reintroduce them to the public alongside outstanding wild seedlings. So with that, go ahead, Sean. Okay, great. Can you hear me? I'm assuming you can hear me. Yep, we can. Sounds okay. good. Okay, great. Um, hi. Uh, so I just want to say that it's actually a great honor being here uh, tonight, speaking. Uh, you know, besides uh, Dan and Matt, um, I just couldn't imagine ever speaking with both of them. I look up to both of those uh, fellows, so I'm really excited to be here. So tonight, I hope to present you some information that um, may. Um, spur your interest in fruit exploration and uh, embracing seedling fruit. So with that being said, uh, let me start this presentation. Oop, got to take you back to the beginning. There we go. Okay, so um, tonight I want to talk to you about rediscovering fruit. And when I was putting together this presentation, I thought about, okay, what is it to, am I sharing my screen? Am I, am I doing that? I think I'm not, sure. not oh. yet. Okay, we there we go. On share. Sorry, there we go. If that works. Yeah. And there then, you go. Awesome. Sorry, I thought it was, there we go. Okay, so tonight I want to talk to you about this concept about rediscovering fruit and uh, fruit trees in, in particular. And it just came about, I guess, in the last uh, few years that I was looking for these heirloom uh, varieties of fruit that have been lost. And at the same time, I was discovering new varieties of seedling fruit that had never been discovered before. Um, so it didn't make much sense uh, to discard these fruit or push them aside because they weren't the heirlooms I was looking for. In some cases, they were quite outstanding. So this concept of rediscovering fruit is sort of how I go about uh, my fruit exploration journey now. Uh, that encompasses both looking for lost heritage varieties or heirloom varieties of uh, fruit, as well as uh, what I want to say is outstanding apples. So I want to preface tonight's discussion, though, by saying that my particular interest um, in apples and pears and, um, and apples in particular are for dessert, uh, for, are for the dessert variety type or fresh eating um, apples. Um, I have a family full of alcoholics. And I probably have those genes as well. So uh, I didn't want to get drunk on my own product. And so cider has been one of those things that I enjoy, but 
I definitely would never want to start a business doing it because it probably would not be very profitable. And especially with my family uh, members or whatever. So uh, tonight, I'll, if I'm talking about finding seedlings, it's mostly for fresh eating. Um, so I explained to you, uh, discover, so this rediscovering concept and it's uh, discovering new wild seedling varieties while trying to rediscover lost heirlooms. Um, so in my search for um, historical uh, varieties, it became necessary to really figure out what was growing or what was growing in this area, this area being central Illinois in particular, um, which, you know, can stretch all the way up to southern, you know, south of Chicago, all the way down to Missouri. Uh, but what was offered around here was going to guide my searches. Um, so that, so it became really necessary to try to figure out, is there any literature out there about the nurseries that were around in the 1800s, uh, all the way up until the early 1900s, um, looking at maybe any of the university holdings at the University of Illinois, uh, did they have any uh, plates of fruit tree, fruits, fruit illustration or um, wax sculptures? I came to learn that the University of Illinois actually lost its uh, collection of wax sculptures. Uh, so uh, there were some moves, um, school agriculture shifted from different buildings, and eventually somehow was all those wax sculptures got lost along the way. Um, and then rediscovery really, uh, rediscovering lost heritage varieties or limbs really entails just getting out there and looking, physically walking or driving um, the countryside and looking for old, just ancient trees. These trees right now are on the edge of going out of existence because they are so old. And so, it really takes just getting out there and it's not searching for old orchards that might have been around in the 1800s and into the early 1900s. For the most part, those are gone in that in this region of the United States. It really entails looking at the old farmyards and former farmsteads and homesteads and just with binoculars and trying to figure out, okay, what did this landowner grow for food, um, for cider, for sugars in the winter for uh, livestock. So these varieties are really found, in my opinion, in former farmyards and homesteads and not those orchards of long, you know, long time ago. Um, in this rediscovery journey, as I aforementioned, uh, discovering new seedling varieties happens consistently. There are just more seedling varieties of fruit out there than there are heirlooms to be found. Um, and then my interest in all of this is not only bringing forth outstanding seedling varieties, uh, particularly dessert types, to the forefront and bringing them into the uh, cultivated setting, but also using their unique set of genetics um, to use in future breeding, uh, whether that imparts some type of disease resistance or some type of particular flavors. Those are all interesting to me, and I would like to use those outstanding genetics going forward. Um, so one of the, I thought one of the interesting things about um, just NAFX was finding, identifying and preserving fruit varieties from the past was one of their, you know, core founding uh, missions. And that, you know, that fit exactly with what I was doing. So in my search for out, uh, lost heritage apples in particular um, that I was doing for a few years, I came about this pear. The first thing I found was a pear. It wasn't an apple that I really, you know, was out there just searching for, it was a pear. And the pear I found, I believe, is called Dearborn Seedling. And this pear has been believed to have been extinct since the 1800, uh, late 1800s. Um, and this is just from the Pears in New York uh, quote, but it just says, Dear, uh, Dearborn Seedling Pear, once a favorite, Dearborn is now nearly lost to cultivation and few or no nurserymen grow the trees. It is it is too good of a variety to be lost. It was very, it was a really outstanding pair in its day. Um, and it was really coveted for how easy it was to grow, including its uh, disease resistance to fire blight. So here you'll see some illustrations of Dearborn seedling, different plates from different um, uh, illustrators. And then you'll see in the bottom um, corner, right hand corner, um, the actual fruit from the tree that, uh, the mother tree that I had identified and found. Um, Next, you'll see the actual mother tree in all her glory, just laden with pears, just covered, healthy, uh, vigorous. Um, it's, it's amazing. This tree is just 
old and beautiful and self fertile fire blight resistant fire blight resistant and uh, producing to this day. So, in discovering Dearborn seedling, I needed to figure out well how did this particular pair get here? And what I discovered was that there was this nursery and it was very local and it was probably about three miles away from where this pair was located. And it was called Dunlap's Nursery. In fact, it was one of the largest earth nurseries in the Midwest. Uh, one of the largest nurseries um, until um, a nursery named FK Phoenix Nursery popped up uh, down the road in Bloomington, Normal, Illinois. At this time it was um, started by a gentleman named Matthias L. Dunlap. And um, it constituted 150 acres here in Champaign County. Um, so 2020 was just a really weird year. Um, and so, like I said, the nursery I thought this pair might've came from was called Dunlap Nursery in a loose internet search, but there was no information about this nursery anywhere to be found. There was a lot of information on FK Phoenix Nursery over in Bloomington Normal, but not so much on uh, Dunlap's nursery. So I just kept looking and looking, asking questions, talking to people um, that were at historical societies and um, just historians all over. Uh, really trying to find this information, going to ag extension offices, the university. And what it took is just really pouring through volumes of volumes of books that were in boxes uh, from the 1800s about different families in the county. And I came across this old ledger that was for the family, for the Dunlap family, and pasted inside this ledger were pages and pages and pages from the catalogs uh, that he published with all his nursery offerings. And uh, I have this for multiple years and it was significant because it was so exhaustive and the diverse selection of fruit that he offered was amazing for the eight, late 1850s into the 1860s. So I found this outstanding collection and I'm like, hey, I found Dunlap's catalog list. Does anyone really want, does anyone want to see this? And it was like crickets. Um, there, you know, we were in a pandemic. I really didn't hear from anyone. So I just figured it was of you know, little interest. Um, so what you'll see here on the left are pages, the two left pictures are from Dunlap's catalog. And you'll see Dearborn Seedling with the arrows pointing to that as one of the pairs he was offering. It was a summer pear. It came into fruiting um, or into harvest uh, very early. Um, we're talking here in this zone, which is zone 5B. Um, um, towards the end of July, all the way into August. So it precedes uh, Bartlett, um, and so it's extremely early. And then you'll see the second largest uh, nursery in Illinois on the right, the next two pictures, as FK Phoenix Nursery, and you'll see him also offering Dearborn Seedling Pear. So that we have two large nurseries, one that's approximately 150 acres, one that grew to 600 acres, um, in a probably hour and a half by car now drive, so along Interstate 74. So the chances of this pair coming from one of these nurseries, and I believe it's Dunlap because it's very close to where the pair is found, um, is highly likely. It meets a lot of uh, criteria. Um, and I used the pairs in New York and some other exclusion criteria to get to this point. Here's a picture of um, Dunlap's nursery from aerial photography in the 1940s. Remember, I'm showing you pictures from the 1960s of the, or 1860s for the catalog. So the nursery went on for quite a while um, in its current, or in its former location. Um, but sadly today, um, you'll see here, uh, one of these lines is the highway and the other one next to it is the uh, Illinois Central Railroad. So Dunlap, uh, positioned his nursery in a very strategic spot where travelers could come through and buy fruit trees. And it is my belief that these trees made their way along the uh, railroad to surrounding towns. And those towns um, in particular might have existing trees on them that are very ancient and represent a few lost varieties. Why I'm showing this FK Phoenix nursery slide is that he was a very um, um, I want to say a clairvoyant individual. He was very forward thinking. He came from Delavan, Wisconsin, uh, down to uh, Illinois to start a nursery that was 
became very large. But he also had the, uh, you know, the, uh, I guess the vision of uh, coupling colored illustrated pictures of the fruit along with the trees and shrubs that he was selling. So it, this is like unheard of. This guy's got a colored catalog. He's showing you everything that you can grow and what it will look like. That's amazing. And that really helped his business. And that artist was actually William Henry Prestele. And Prestele, um, if that name sounds familiar, would actually leave um, Phoenix Nursery after Phoenix had filed for bankruptcy and become the first artist employed by the USDA Pomological Division as an illustrator. He was the first illustrator in many of the beautiful illustrations that you can find in Dan's book and the USDA's Pomological Watercolor Holdings. You'll see on the left, a very uh, early work by him and a, on the right, one of the USDA uh, illustrations that he did. You can see his style changed over time and that's why I included that there. Uh, the railroads really offered a way for fruit to move. And this is super interesting here. We've got Dunlap Nursery over here on this side of the state. And we've got FK Phoenix Nursery in the middle. Then we've got a gentleman named Benjamin Buckman that comes along a little bit later in the early 1900s. And he starts what is the largest private experimental orchard in the United States. He's got over 1900 different varieties of fruit trees. And how this relates to this guy named George Rudy in Colfax, Washington is really amazing. Um, in my search for this, these uh, some lost varieties of heritage fruit, particularly Fulton strawberry apple, which you'll see right here, I came to understand that there was this guy named George Rudy and he was getting a particular, uh, a large amount of scions or trees or whatever he was getting from this guy named Benjamin Buckman in, uh, Farmingdale, Illinois. And I was, I talked to David uh, Ben Scotter of the Lost Apple Project about what they were looking for uh, because they had made this uh, reference to Illinois. And he was kind enough to send along um, the catalog of Benjamin Buckman. And I looked through it and I saw that, oh, wait, Benjamin Buckman was also growing this apple called Fulton's uh, Strawberry. So I wanted, I, for, for illustrative purposes, I wanted to show that there is a connection between all of these uh, nurseries and individuals that stretch not only from central Illinois, but all the way over to Washington. And this is in the early 1900s. So what I continue to do now is follow the railroad lines. I am looking in those towns that the railroads were named, the financiers were, you know, the towns are named after them. I'm looking in those towns and those, uh, those farmyards for long lost fruit trees. Uh, that means driving around in the countryside. I'm enlisting the help of fellow fruit enthusiasts in my search. And I'm also crowdsourcing this. I've been on podcasts, um, community boards, posting uh, wanted posters for these uh, apples and pears. Um, and I've authored a few articles uh, just highlighting the lost diversity that was here in central Illinois and trying to get this to be more of a community effort in tracking down long lost fruit. Um, what I like to say sometimes to people uh, that I'm enlisting or asking the help for is that the trees are there. They are hiding in hedgerows and former farmyards around the county and calling out to be discovered with their brilliant flashes of color and the fruit begging to be sampled and appreciated again by a new generation of consumers with discerning taste and appreciation for things that are old and once lost. These heritage, trees and their fruit don't subscribe to any perfectly designed packaging or characteristics to make them marketable. Instead, they are unapologetically variable and each useful in its own right. And it's far too important to simply dismiss lost varieties as just that without putting forth the effort, uh, a bit of effort in trying to rediscover them. An earlier speaker today who I've spoken to quite a bit uh, that helped me in possibly identifying this pair when I sent scions in, out to the USDA germplasm repository in Corvallis, Oregon, is Joseph Postman. Um, Postman once wrote, we're building a reserve of potential solutions for a future, for future problems. A lack of adversity is a genetic vulnerability. Preserving old heirlooms can hold the key to possibly dealing with future problems. And that is one, re one of many reasons 
they are deserving to be uh, preserved. Um, so working with a, having a gentleman like Joseph Postman and helping me along the way with this pair was invaluable. A few more, few more minutes, Sean. Okay, so we've gotten into this weird thing about apples, you know, uh, being, you know, everything crisp, but finding feral fruits and growing new seedlings and helping, in my opinion, helps to restore the massive amount of biodiversity that was lost at the turn of the century. Uh, so in my search for feral fruit trees, I'm looking for disease, disease resistance, vigor, productivity, fruiting time, and fruit quality. Um, embracing feral fruit, uh, they, they can possess a unique set of flavors that is a perfect symphony of conjugation of acids, sugars, acids, phenolics, and volatile compounds. They require minimal time to be to introduce versus traditional breeding, and they require little cost for discovery and cultivation and offer a wealth of unique unique genetics that can be used for future breeding. This is an apple um, that was found outside a jazz restaurant in Chicago. Um, it's um, a great apple. I will play the video now. I hope that plays of the owner. It's not playing yet. If Oh, is it not playing? Okay, I might be able to include it in the, uh, um, that is the owner of the restaurant that put the uh, apple on his menu. This is, this is another tree by it. Feral trees are uniquely uh, adapted to the soils and microclimates that they grow in. Uh, they have unique hole tolerances uh, and they've come about by natural selection. So in a way they have superior genetics or they don't. And this is easily assessed when you discover them. Um, Feral trees for breeding, for me, uh, this is really uh, uh, looking at their adaptability within this microclimate of central Illinois and how well they do, because they could do much better probably than some trees that were developed outside of this area. Um, they might have disease resistance that is uh, to fire blight, which is very uh, prevalent here. Uh, and as I said, uh, enhanced fruit flavors that are lacking, in my opinion, in the current offerings. Uh, Milo Gibson, one of my favorite apples out there, was discovered by one of the co-founders of NAFX. Uh, it's an outstanding apple, but, and it illustrates um, not only did Milo Gibson go out and um, search for feral fruit, um, he discovered this wonder, wonderful apple. Um, I think a lot of things going forward, there needs to be a change in conversation to correct misconceptions around seedling fruit and that all seedling fruit are bad. Not all seedling fruit that I found last season were great. Uh, I think I sampled 40 apples, maybe five of them were good. Uh, two of them are worth uh, checking back in, uh, checking back on next season. Uh, so this really uh, entails uh, supporting breeders, supporting uh, people like uh, Temperate Orchard Conservancy, uh, people like uh, Stephen Edholm, AKA Skill Cult, uh, people that put on uh, pomological exhibitions like uh, Matt Kaminsky, who's coming up next. Uh, whether it's through donations, purchasing uh, Amazon affiliated links, we really need to support the people that are out there uh, trying to bring forward these uh, seedling varieties in a meaningful way. Uh, and just one last thing, um, I think when you're out there and you're exploring for feral fruit, uh, you really need to keep your eyes open for other things that are out there. Um, you are going to discover amazing things. These are uh, one pound plus pawpaws in the middle. Uh, really great tasting persimmons, uh, some heat cans on the left. Uh, there are people that are interested in more than what you might just be looking for. So it really helps to develop a network or be part of a network like NAFX. So you don't cast aside any things because you don't know them. They might be valuable to other people. And that's why it's great being, you know, part of an organization like this um, and finding new and lost varieties of fruit. And with that, thank you. Awesome, Sean. Thank you. You're right. We got we got to pay attention to all the porous goodies around us. Okay, so I'd like to introduce the final speaker for tonight's panel, and that's Matt Kaminsky. Matt, known in the orchard world as Gnarly Pippins, is that a cool name? Is an orchardist and shepherdist from Hadley, Massachusetts. This year, Matt organized the second annual Wild and Seedling. Uh, pomological exhibit in Ashfield, Massachusetts. He is the author of the Wild Apple Forager's Guide 
and co-manages Meadow Fed Lamb. Catch up with Matt at gnarlypippins.com. All right, Matt, go ahead. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks to Dan and Sean and all of Nafex for getting this all together. Yeah, it's crazy being in the company of legends here. Uh, it was really incredible hearing what Sean's been w working on the last uh, two years with Dearborn Seedling and the new hunts coming. Uh, pretty insane that Dan can possibly expand even more on the absolute ocean of knowledge that he dropped on us a few years ago. So anyway, really blessed to be here. And um, yeah, geez, just coming off the last two weeks uh, was our, our second pomological exhibition that I know. Hopefully some of the people in attendance of this virtual thing uh, actually were, were lucky enough to be there, taste some of the amazing fruit that people are bringing in. So um, yeah, I for the last, I don't know, eight years I've been working in cultivated orchards and a lot more in the you know later part of that time window in wild orchards and wild apple trees and just with feral fruit trees in general um, but taking a focus on on wild apples in particular so in this little little three-part saga my third my third panel here I guess I'm going to just talk a little bit about how yeah how I interpret sort of the, the space between, or I guess where the two spaces of cultivated and wild orchards kind of intersect um, and what that journey has been like. So I'm gonna start this screen share here. Uh, let's check it out. All right, are we doing it yet? I think that that should be working, so. Uh, Looks good. All right, great. <laughs> So there you go, exploring wild and cultivated orchards. So we all know there is a, a real, a real spectrum of different sort of appearances that fruit trees and fruit orchards uh, are going to take, whether it's apples, pears, pawpaws, whatever. But you know, just looking specifically in, in apples, um, you know, I like to take, I like to always look at the the perspective of the tree in all seasons and in all forms. A lot of people just focused exclusively on the fruit, but um, we all know that the trees can exhibit just as many differences between one another as the as the fruits themselves and the varieties of fruit that you're going to find. So, um, yeah, just in in ex that that the word exploring is pretty much all there is to it because there's there's infinite diversity out there. Um, even when you get down to, to exhibiting different forms and different shapes, you know, even the dormant season um, in some of the orchards, wild orchards that I've been uh, lucky enough to prune, these are some of the same kinds of feral, scrubby, you know, apple rich woodland ecosystems that uh, through a little bit of manipulation, you can really select out um, some of the competing timber species and select down to fruit trees and get a really, really nice like wild orchard where you have, you know, no, no real organization to the trees, but you, you have them all exhibiting their own kind of uh, characteristics and their own traits. Um, so even ignoring, ignoring even just the, the fruit themselves, the trees have so much to offer in terms of an exploration. And on the contrary, you know, you have this very, very different kind of look, you know, humans are able to isolate the things that you most want out of these wild trees that people have discovered, you know, thousands and thousands of people have discovered tens or hundreds of thousands of varieties and isolated them and put them into this kind of peculiar uh, ecotype of an orchard, which is a little bit natural, a little bit unnatural. Um, and so, yeah, this particular orchard I've been, I've been caring, starting to care for a little more in the past few years. Uh, this is a research orchard in the town of Heath, Massachusetts, which is also very rich in seedling resources as a, as a sort of place. Um, and the person who planted this orchard happens to be one of, the, one of the two researchers who helped develop the red sticky ball trap for control of apple maggot fly in the 1970s. Um, it's a really cool orchard. Anyone's ever in town, I'll give you a tour. Um, but anyway, yeah, you know, so this is, this is the archetypal uh, format of, of 
millennia of, of fruit selection. So how do you get from one place to another? You know, one of the things I, I've had a lot of opportunities, especially more recently in educating folks about, you know, what, what kind of work I'm doing of looking for noteworthy wild apple trees and then also having the platform and some of the resources to make a call out to other folks doing this work and gathering a lot of the fruit that's being discovered and, uh, you know, coveted or revered for whatever reason and gathering it into one sort of place to hold these exhibitions we've done uh, twice now and with great results. So in doing this kind of education, telling people about what the events are and just teaching people who don't come from a place of orchard knowledge or, or of apple knowledge, what, you know, what even is a variety, you know, like that's, that sounds like such a basic thing, especially for folks in Mafex who've been immersed in this work, but, you know, it, it's a little bit of a revelation to even as someone like like myself or any of you who, who are, you know, sort of from that place of knowledge to, to cycle back in this loop of learning and say, oh yeah, well, geez, I mean, at one point, every known variety was a chance seedling. And if it wasn't a chance seedling, it was a seedling from an intentional breeding project or, or just an informal breeding project. Um, you know, every variety that has been uh, cultivated, selected and propagated for, for any amount of time started from a seed germinating. So that's a bit of a revelation, even though it's the most, most basic of, of facts, but um, putting it in that language can sometimes help you figure, figure something new out. So anyway, this is sort of a, a behind the scenes of us setting up. We had an incredible group of volunteers this year, uh, had a couple early attendants who were there helping us. <laughs> uh, anyhow, this is, this is a picture from inside the Ashfield Community Hall. It's, a, it's, the, it's the venue where we hold the Wild and Seedling Pomological Exhibition this past year and in 2019. And yeah, we just fill tables and tables and, and basically any plank of space that you can put a paper plate full of fruit and a placard and some information about the trees. Um, you know, take every inch of space we can and put some fruit on display. And this is this is basically a a gathering of uh, just under 50 different people who have submitted together 103 varieties in the 2021 uh, iteration of this. Uh, basically things that they've found out while exploring either just, just chance coincidental uh, observations, people who are professional cider makers, apple enthusiasts, orchardists, looking for novel varieties of fruit for one of the reasons that, uh, you know, Sean detailed in his, in his piece, um, you know, looking for novel flavors, looking for disease resistance, um, some of these are, you know, pretty, pretty common reasons, um, but it's an, it's an amazing collection because not only are you getting all new material, things that people haven't tasted before, things that haven't ever seen the light of day in a way. Um, and the, the special thing about this gathering is that it's not, you know, when, when people select those heirloom varieties, so this, this orchard here, you know, this is, these are old, old varieties with an eye toward making cider. However, you have to remember that when people do select varieties, when people select any of these crazy seedlings, what they're getting is something that speaks to them and their, their set of experiences, their lived experience, uh, their th things that, that, that make them feel something. Uh, based on their their own life and their their personality or whatever, so it, it's these varieties of fruit really really when you do a tasting of heirloom apples versus wild seedlings that were discovered and introduced in the last two years, you're getting this different cultural viewpoint where people are expressing an interest in more eccentric flavors, things that aren't always expressly you know pleasant to the palate but things that speak more to the types of cider that people are interested in making now sometimes that includes some shock value like we had a, a variety a couple of years ago some of you maybe a couple of you might remember this but it was a variety from coastal Oregon called called crow's egg and the juice of this variety tasted like 
salty bilge water, like barnacle crustacean craziness. And it was not, you know, the most pleasant thing, but it was absolutely unique. Um, and I'm sure that someone is making a very interesting cider with that or doing something very interesting with it. So anyhow, we have tons of these things on display and, um, you know, stay tuned. If you, if you want to learn more about the details there, you know, there, there's going to be a compendium of that coming next year, early in the winter, but, um, just to, yeah, just to show you a little bit what, you know, this is a typical day. We get five or six packages in the mail, all full of apples, sometimes five or six varieties uh, packed into a single box separated by egg cartons or plastic wrap or something. A lot of NAFEX members, I'm sure, are used to the mail order, you know, fruit post, fruit in the post kind of thing. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Again, a tremendous amount of work, uh, just, just logging phenotypes and making sure you get it. I have this nice little neat form that I like to use for integrating these things and making sure that when people submit these, it's not just, oh, cool, like let's just make a spectacle of it. But, but no, this is actually an opportunity to introduce things formally. And that sort of event of an introduction is actually a pretty big fixture. I'm sure that someone like Dan Bussey could say a lot about that. Um, because again, when you're when you're documenting these varieties 100 years in the future, when people aren't really growing them or whatever, you've been through a couple of wars and a lot of trees got cut down or something like this. Um, you know, you have to rely on some literature. You have to rely on the fact that this was formally introduced at an event, and someone wrote a pamphlet or a, a nursery catalog, or someone wrote proceedings from so and so state pomological event. You know, these are important things to document the fruit that's being grown at a certain time to, to document the culture of, of that present moment in orcharding. So anyhow, that's, that's a little bit of the work that I'm doing right now, getting ready for that next volume to come out in the winter. But um, uh, just one more, one more peek here, but uh, what I, what I really kind of want to get into is sort of where, where the, where the, where the threshold is between this, this notion of wild and cultivated. So you know, it, it really doesn't take long to, to isolate a wild apple or a wild pear uh, from its state of origin, from the original tree or the mother tree, as I and most of us probably refer to them, um, you know, into a space of cultivation. However, it's, you know, it, it may be a, a quick process, but it's absolutely not simple. Um, and I, yeah, I speak from sort of shared experience with a couple growers that I've been working closely with to try and bring some of my own seedling discoveries into a space of cultivation so that, you know, it may be evaluated for further use, um, you know, at large or, or not depending on the results. So um, I'm gonna sort of take you through four varieties uh, that I've been following, four of my, my sort of I have a sort of a personal collection that I that I really follow these mother trees pretty closely. I prune them. I'm dealing with uh, growing new sources of scion woods, so we have really high quality scion woods instead of really wimpy little twigs from, you know, ancient mother trees growing in pretty poor soil, that kind of thing. Um, but anyway, I'm going to take you through four and show you sort of the lessons from the the first several years of trying growing these ex situ. Um, so ex situ, I'll use that phrase. I'm sure some of you are familiar with it, but for those who aren't just, you know, meaning out, outside of the, the, the mother tree in, in this circumstance. So first one I want to talk about uh, is Thornton brass. Uh, this is a cool tree from a pretty cool groovy place where there's like a, <clears throat> a an old hayfield, very agricultural area. Um, I think that the, the there's a population of wild apples growing scattered throughout this hayfield, and I, I think that you know as as most people who forage out there understand you know human behavior in the past has a huge impact on the traits of the wild apples that you'll be finding and so anyhow, anyhow everything in this area seems to have a really really interesting just just really interesting phenotypes and. Definitely think that there was a culture of cider making in this area in the past uh, because of the just some of the traits of these varieties are, are, are really lend themselves to that. So anyhow, this is a variety I call Thornton brass brass because the color of the apple is very 
brilliant yellow. Um, here's a sort of specimen from the mother tree. This one has this uh, red red sun cheek on it. It's not totally typical of the variety, but it does, it, you know, it, it is a nice, a nice thing. It's a nice thing when you get that. So anyway, um, that is, you know, essentially up, up until I started really grafting this widely, I assumed this is sort of the, the final form of this apple. And really what folks don't realize is that you know, the, the same way that gravity will pack any, it's going to act on an object. And, and you know, if you, if you see a drop of water suspended in air, you know, it's, it's packed into a circle because gravity is, for, is, is acting on it. There are different various forces acting on it. And so if you look at that and, and overlay that metaphor to an apple tree and, and fruit growing in general, there are a number of forces that are more or less constant that act in a way on a given tree and sort of shape the fruit that it's producing into a certain form and that form can four, four minutes oh my god we are Sorry, not Matt. doing well no worries all right i'm going to hurry this up anyway um this apple looks really great to me we started growing it ex situ bang you got tons of vigor too much vigor in some in some regards but you know, it's just a high vigor variety so you can note the disparities in the growth habit. Um, this is very vertical, very bushy. Contrast that with this, wow, total difference. And then the fruit we get, we have a uh, really, really crazy variety in the phenos uh, going on here. Not the same at all in terms of comparing to the mother tree. Really uh, sort of similar juice flavor, juice characteristics are, are very similar to the mother tree, but totally a different kind of thing. So we have a lot to work out in terms of knowing how, you know, what changes over that, that, you know, that threshold of wild tree to cultivated situation. Um, another one I'll just touch on quickly. I'll probably, I'll probably skip a few of these, you know, just maybe do two varieties in terms of talking about this, uh, this sort of transition from the, the original to the, to the propagated version, but this is another one. This is one of one of, I would call a premier a premier variety because it's so versatile. Thornton brass, which I just talked about, is really a primarily a cider variety, but Old Fertile is a really interesting apple. Um, extremely hard fruit, late season, extremely high sugars, often often twenty or you know twenty one to twenty two bricks off the tree, and very palatable. Extremely sweet, very very slight bitterness uh, just underneath the skin and a really, really excellent apple, both for cider making, uh, storage, fresh eating, pretty much everything. And, um, you know, this is a specimen from the mother tree. Again, smaller fruit, some, some scale you can see on the skin, um, the shot of the mother tree fruit. And you can see the difference when you grow that outside of the, the original tree, you get much larger fruit. The shape is a little different. You're getting more uh, of a round oblate instead of more of a globular, globular form. So, you know, there, there's so much that can change. You know, you can, you can make up your paradigms about what an apple is supposed to look like and really find out that there are gonna be a lot of disparities in the size and the shape. And it's not just a straight road from taking scions and grafting them. You know, there, there are a lot of things that are the same, but for as many things that are similar between those, those two, the fruits in both situations, there's a lot that changes. And in most cases, the fruit, the juice quality has, you know, the fruit characteristics when you look at the, you know, the bricks reading, um, look at the dates of ripening, things like this. That are pretty consistent and in some cases you actually get higher sugar production in these cultivated trees than the tortured you know sunlight or water starved mother trees growing off in drainage ditches and that kind of thing you actually in some cases we've seen an increase in the bricks level on some of these varieties in cultivation which is a really interesting twist even in a wet year so um we're going to be watching these more closely so i'm going to leaf through a couple more photos maybe a little more quickly than the last two um, nail biter. This is another variety from that some of you might recognize from my catalog. Um, it's kind of a typical uh, wasted shaped apple, waist with an eye, you know, like a waistline. So it has this kind of funny belted shape. And that in cultivation, have a more exaggeration that 
that that form, that shape, obviously huge fruit size, um, but you get that the really, really similar um, russeting pattern in this. And this, this particular variety is just an insane bitter shark, totally like rock your face off. So, you know, these are one of the four varieties we have grafted currently at Rose Hill Farm in the Hudson Valley. There's an amazing, amazing orchard. I really hope you guys all get a chance to visit them at some point. Uh, finally, Ed's winter, mother tree, in the, the fall on the left, early fall before the fruit's really ripe. And then again, in, in March, when I was there to collect sandwood, this is why it's called Ed's winter. It's a true winter apple uh, where the fruit is actually still usable at this point. Uh, the, the skin doesn't puncture or, or soften. You can actually use the fruit frozen on the tree, even in late, late winter. Um, so here have a specimen collected from Ed's winter. And then again, on top work, Really nice, nice, nice photo of these apples. And again, two, two different specimens of ex situ growth that you get quite a difference. So um, I think Chris might be giving me the high sign that it's time to switch to Q and A. So uh, I, it's, it's one of those things like we're all so passionate and it's like uh, children are playing, you know, we're all like, we all have that childhood <laughs> spirit of passion of life. And it's like, oh, sorry, kids, we gotta go. You know, it's like the worst. It's saying the worst thing. Because anyway, uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, I believe everybody else does. And so we're gonna switch over to Q and A. Uh, and Taylor Malone's gonna be handling that. And uh, so, Taylor, what do you think? Yeah, we got some great questions in here. So we'll try and do rapid fire here. And I'll let uh, Chris kind of throw the questions to whoever. So the first one was about the QR codes. And there were, uh, there were a couple of people are curious about it. Is there a good source for that? How to make that happen? Yeah, Dan. Uh, sure, there is a good source right now. I worked with one at Seat Savers that did barcodes. And I think we could switch that over to a QR without too much grief. It's on. It's printed on plastic. It has a duration of many years without uh, it deforming. So um, when I find out something, I'll be happy to put that on, post it on Nafex uh, website or something. Uh, let people know where I can get a hold of one. I've got a couple of ways we could laminate something, but like everything else, it it fades in the sun. So it's going to be uh, something that would have to be replaced probably about every five years just to be safe. Uh, all right. Are Dearborn seedling scion wood or trees currently available? Uh, what do you think, Sean? I okay. So here's the here's the uh, thing on Dearborn. So I mentioned Joseph Postman earlier, um, and I sent scion wood out to Corvallis uh, so I can get that so I can get the tree. Um, I hope to be DNA fingerprinted, but a clear answer on it. It's a great pair in that it fills this void of pairs that come on later. It precedes Bartlett. So it's extremely early. It's a dessert type. It's delicious. It's vigorous and it's disease free. So to answer your question, is it available? I hope to make it available next season with the understanding that all sales will, all sales of Scion will go towards people that are uh, doing great things for fruit, like Temperate Orchard Conservancy or Stephen at Home at Skill Call. I don't want any money off the trees. I want them to be able to be funded to continue what they're doing. So if my find helps them do that, then that's awesome. So I hope to make that stuff available next season. Um, and hopefully it is Dearborn Seedling and we can have a super early pair. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to weave in and I've, I've told Sean this, but uh, Joseph Postman told me that uh, in his, when he was giving his workshop earlier today, one of the uh, pairs that he mentioned was uh, that they have analyzed is um, the Hogger Grove pear, mm. which is uh, Oregon's largest pear tree. And it's uh, near Salem, Oregon, right off the highway. And it has parentage uh, with the father being Bartlett. And he suspects that if, if I'm saying this right, Joseph, he suspects this, that that is Dearborn seedling. So uh, confirmation might be coming soon and later. Yeah, it would, it would be great if this is Dearborn seedling. And if there's two Dearborn seedling uh, trees, that would be even better. Uh, 
this tree was too coveted and too wildly cultivated uh, across the country um, to disappear so quickly and uh, out of sight. So yeah, hopefully this is it and we could both make, uh, we could both make this available to the public. That would be awesome. I think this one's for Matt. Do you make an effort to quantify the quality of apples sent in or are they all just introduced? Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely make a great effort to describe qualitatively what, what these are really like. Um, I do that both through my, my own description, some, some of the books that I've read that have really give a great sense of how, how you ought to describe apples is very helpful in that, but also using the information that the folks who submitted them gave me, as well as um, if you attend the exhibition, you will have the opportunity to write notes about each variety down. And so through, through those three sources, I'm sort of forming a composite of information to write a, what, I, what I hope to be a very complete profile of these. And, and then with that, in, you know, sort of introduce these to the public through this, um, yeah, the publication that we'll be making. So, uh, yeah. Joseph Postman uh, responded and says, the hogger grove pear in Oregon may also be Durborn. I hope to compare it. Awesome, and awesome. Janet B, Janet B also just weaving in here says that uh, the Dearborn seedling turns up in Shin's nursery catalog from 1878, which oh, was wow. out in California. And that's H-S-H-I-N-N. -N. That would be... I would love to see if she's on face in the Facebook group. I would love to see that, uh, like a picture of that listing. I've gathered so much on Dearborn that would just help, you know, the whole story of how far this pair spread. If if you look in uh, cut and paste, if anybody looks in the Q and A, they can see an archive.org uh, link. Archive.org is a great place to find nursery catalogs, by the way. Okay. Um, yeah, that's cool. I was just reading the description on there. I don't see a picture, but maybe I haven't looked hard enough. Um, Eric asks, are all of those Wisconsin La Crescent trees local seedlings or were they available nationally as well as in Wisconsin? Uh, a number of them were uh, local seedlings, of course, but some of them did have some national uh, circulation. There were a few that did. I can't think of the ones right off the top of my head. But uh, they were ones that were popular in the Midwest and did get around. They got around to probably about half a dozen Midwest states. I'm not sure how far all of them did. All right, well, moving right we along. Still, we still have some time for a few more questions. So get your, get your fingers warmed up and type in. How I've, about I've, that? I've got some too, if, uh, if we don't have any more come in. Yeah, the uh, park, what do you got, Taylor? Now I'll, I'll ask the ones that people ask first. What are some of the techniques you use to encourage mother trees to produce good cyan wood? Um, Matt could probably answer this a lot better than <laughs> I can. So uh, I'll just answer it real quickly. Um, so on feral trees in the countryside, it's very easy just to go up to them, uh, cut a hole in them, open them up and get them in a, successive year uh, to produce better wood. Um, if you're worried about the tree being taken down, um, going high up, getting it on the sunny side, or even dealing with water sprouts might be your only way. Um, in city, when you're in the city, that's much more difficult. Um, so in, the sh in a city that rhymes with Winnebago or Trivago, if you're on city property and you're getting uh, you're getting scion wood that can also get you arrested or electrocuted um, by train tracks. Um, you have to be much more careful about that. <laughs> um, and so you have to, I'm, I'm just going to say this, but you, you probably need a getaway driver. Um, you probably need a lookout and you need to get wood, like I said, from the sunny side of the tree. And sometimes you need to look official. So get what you can from city trees, Country trees um, are a little bit different. Matt could probably do a better job legally of describing everything. 
What isn't there a movie Oceans? Isn't this the Oceans Eleven? <laughs> <laughs> Apples Eleven. Get a reflective <laughs> vest and a hard hat, and then you go anywhere. Yeah, totally. I if mean, you honestly, if you look like you need that apple, like you probably have some issues, people will leave you alone. Like in <laughs> in cities, people think you are. They're like, okay, there goes that crackhead, and they'll just leave you alone. <laughs> Matt, do you want to answer the same same question? I'm, I'm sure you have insights as well. Sure, yeah. I mean, just to elaborate on what Sean just what Sean just said is, you know, pruning is probably the first thing that you should look to do um, because, again, you know, apple trees have that amazing ability of regrowth. So once you know their response to any pruning cut, even even dead wood in some cases, is to respond with stronger, more vertical one year wood, which is what you're trying to capture for for really good quality scion wood. Um, and oftentimes better scion wood will lead to better nursery stock growing when you when you end up do grafting that. Um, and it's, you know, you, you can sometimes bargain with yourself on ethics, but it seems like a little unethical maybe to start fertilizing wild feral trees because again, they're sort of the product of an environment rather than whatever. So, you know, vigor also affected by nutrition, you might want to just, just start with pruning and see what you can get from that before you, before you go to any greater lengths and just get what you can and then start grafting little scion farm trees. That's, that's another technique that some folks on here, including myself do, where you just set some grafts on a really vigorous tree, top working so that you have an entire root system of an established tree going into that. And you get some very good scion wood, even from a very rinky dink kind of thing growing on a tree that has way too much vigor isn't going to produce a ton of apples but you know we'll grow you some great sign wood too rs uh rs clarified their question and said i was referring to really old mother trees i have some trees over 100 years old that do not produce much new growth i live in a very old abandoned orchard so i don't know if, if you would add anything to what you already said but well, I mean, I might just add that if it's if it's a place where you live and it's a you know possibly even grafted old trees, but but even old seedlings, um, you know, if if it's a place that you feel like you can profitably and, and legitimately sort of give some passive fertilizer or fertility to them in the form of manure or compost or whatever, that it's a sh it's not necessarily going to be overnight, but you might in the space of one or two, possibly three years, get some some. Uh, you know, a decent ratcheting up of, of growth from water sprouts, maybe lower in the canopy if you do that. So might suggest that if it's possible. Okay. Um, what do you think, Taylor? There's a lot of good ones here. There's yeah. the one about bush. Yeah, I think the apple Dan mentioned something bush, high bricks and astringency. How can we get our hands on some scion? We're gonna make that available pretty soon. It's the crone bush. It's spelled K-R-O-N-E-B-U-S-C-H. That's named after the family where it was found in central Minnesota. Um, and uh, it's we're propagating it, so it's it's coming along. It's kind of a spindly tree in the orchard, but I'm able to probably get cuttings. If you were to contact me directly, I might be able to uh, supply you with a number of cuttings this coming spring. So. Um, I can handle so many. I have a source that I can get some from at this point in time. So, so you, know, you, know, you a know a guy. <laughs> I know a guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, here's a follow up, Dan. Uh, Chris Abramson asks uh, You had mentioned a list of the Wisconsin apples. What is, is that available? I can make it available. Yes, I have it on. Uh, that's one of the things I have on my computer. I can uh, make a copy and send it to you or be Could, able to email put it in the Google you. Drive. I could do that um, at some point in time. I've got to revise one little thing on it before I can send it out. But okay. yeah, I can put that together. Uh, more more follow-ups uh, from the the uh, Dearborn. Dearborn uh, has definitely struck a chord with everybody. Joseph again says it is was also listed in the old uh, Oregon nursery, the St. Helens nursery from 1864. No image though. Oh wow, eighteen six. Wow, that's early. So this this at this pair just made its way from Massachusetts over literally to the other side of the United States in no time. Um, Oregon had all sorts of stuff back in the day, Still but it, but it it really says a lot about just 
how good this pair was and it's mm-hmm. you know and how it's sadly how quickly it fell out of um cultivation but it's smaller than a lot of pears out there um but it's prolific and it's tastes delicious and it's early it's so early well we got we got five more minutes what do you think taylor yeah um i'm gonna be selfish and ask a question matt are you um in your ex situ plantings do you have multiple instantiations of those where you're comparing the mother tree to this individual, to that individual, and are like the ex situ ones pretty much identical, whereas the mother tree is really the outlier? Are you seeing quite a lot of variability across all the grafted trees? Oh, great question. Um, the one area where I've really been able to dig into that is with this this variety, uh, Ed's Winter. This is a uh, this is what it looks like from one of our ex situ plantings, and you know, in the the mother tree. You could, oops, sorry about that. <laughs> you can sort of see that there's there's still a little bit of that striping uh, that comes in underneath, but the, there's been some other subtle variations in the in the phenotype. Um, yeah, I, I'm seeing pretty vast differences in in both, you know, of the cultivated settings that that's been grafted, um, where one of them being more of a non-chemical, uh, passive kind of growing method, uh, in contrast with the more the slightly more commercial style growing, um, yields a, a apple that's a little more faithful to the mother tree, but still pretty vastly different for a lot of reasons. So uh, you get a great a great variation, and I think that that is to be expected. So. Uh, another reason to keep grafting widely in a different, you know, in many different places. So we got we got three more minutes. Uh, I wanted to say that Janet B had a follow up, and uh, if everybody looks in the Q and A, especially you, Joseph, there's uh, um, a link for CaliforniaReveal.org, and it mentions California Nursery also grew the Dearborn seedling. It's in their orchard book. And oh, she wow. says the books got it from Elwinger and Barry, uh, E L L W A N G E R and Barry B A R R Y. This is in the 1880s. Yeah, they operated a nursery in Rochester, New York. Yeah, it was yeah, they were quite a substantial thing. Um, one thing I do want to mention is with this organization, with this group, I am so thrilled to work with you guys about sharing knowledge. And I'm really thrilled. Sean, you sent me a copy of that Dunlap catalog and I found a variety I had not seen before, which I always keep finding something that's new, a uh, variety called Norwegian Wax. Um, I even checked my Norwegian Apple books and there's not a thing on it like that there. So this is something unique. So thank you all, anyone who likes to uh, share and can. Uh, I appreciate hearing about some strange thing. Send me any if you have a list of Apple names. I always love to look at it. And uh, Matt, I'm going to make sure I record your Apple varieties in my my next iteration and get those in there because it's important. You put a name to them. I got to put them in now. So I'm, that's the rules. <laughs> I definitely, I definitely also want to say thank you to you, Dan, because I sent Dan all of my scans. And he quickly went through them and there was only like three things he didn't recognize or was still around. So he made my search, my searches much shorter by his knowledge. Uh, I wouldn't, I would have been wasting a lot of time if it wasn't for you. I appreciate it. Hey, finding three names, this makes my day. <laughs> Since we have, we have just uh, two more minutes. Um, I just, I would just want to say that this, this represents the power of the internet. The good of the internet is, is that we can come together and work as a hive mind to gather little bits of data as if we were bees and bring it back to the hive and cross-reference and, and come to a greater solution than any one of us could. And so I want to speak just about references. Brett Anderson says, Dan mentioned everyone now has access to the info resources uh, to begin searching for lost fruit. Any recommendations on how uh, basically, uh, any reference, ref, uh, any reference materials that you recommend, and they says recommend also recommendations on resources to start research in a new location, and I guess maybe which Taylor, if you don't mind, we'll throw it out to everyone. I think they were asking you, Dan. 
Oh, okay, maybe so. Um, there are so many reference. Where did it begin? Um, that's that's um, that's a good one. There's a there's a lot of stuff out there, um, but read anything you can wherever you can. Just uh, just look for it. Um, of course, I always like to throw a plug in for my book. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's this beast here. This is just volume one. Anyways, um, the joy of it is, of course, is going through the illustrations that are in it, of course, which are really fun. I got a chance to see every single USDA illustration, which is about 3,500 of apples alone. Um, and I had to pick out about 1,500 or 1,400 that fit in the book that was closest to where these apples originated. As you take them in different places, they look differently. Um, so... Mm. It's, it's, what's a good reference? Old Southern Apples is a fabulous book. Um, this one, of course, lists a lot of things. My book had about 16,350 different apples listed. I think the new one's going to have over 17,000 wow. at this point in time. Um, but that's going to be a ways off. Ah, oh, references. There's so many on, on uh, the book uh, pairs that uh, I think uh, Morgan did. Hang on a second. Yeah, John Morgan um, and Allison Richards. This is a good one on apples. A lot of it is from England, of course. Um, there's depends where you're looking. What are you looking for? And if you want to contact me, I would be more than happy to send you in some resources if I have a little bit more better idea about what you are looking for. Uh, I certainly specialize in apples, but I have some abilities to uh, uh, deal with other fruits as well. Um, I. I would just say we're, we're a little bit over. Um, Oops. So if anybody has any, any uh, other very quick things to say, but Chris, our fearless leader, NAFEX president says that uh, she'd love to see the Dearborn seed line or Dearborn story and how it's progressing uh, be a multi-part saga for our Pomona over the next, next few years. So. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so if anybody has any quick references, just shoot them out really quick. But I'm otherwise I've got to got to wind down, unfortunately, sadly. Okay. Well, uh, on behalf of NAFEX, I'd like to thank all three of you for uh, coming and speaking today. It's been a great conversation. I, I've liked the the cross chatter. Um, I'd like to thank everybody else for showing up and uh, supporting NAFEX and uh, being involved in this and, and rescuing fruit varieties in your own area. I think that's, that's really important work, meaningful work for, for anyone's life. Um, so once again, this uh, recording of the session will be made available on nafex.org and that'll be posted in the next 24 hours. And then after that, in about a year, they'll be posted on our NAFEX TV YouTube page. Um, and as we've talked about several times here, and we've talked about it at other conferences, uh, there's gonna be some uh, downloadable content uh, that you'll be able to uh, review later on and dig through. Um, and don't miss any of the other sessions, you know, make, make your, make your uh, $19 worth it. Uh, tomorrow, we've got uh, Heroes of the Pawpaw and Persimmon Breeding World uh, with uh, Darren Bender Bogard and Buzz Ferber. Should be a great time. And then we also have our keynote, of course, with uh, Michael Phillips happening in, on Saturday evening. And that's not to be missed. Um, he's, he's got a lot of good information to share. So, anyway, without uh, anything else, uh, I, I appreciate everyone and I hope everyone has a good night. <laughs>